Hi, and welcome to another edition of Barnsley Focus. Barnsley Focus features local people who have something interesting to say about their town and local happenings. And we also want to feature some of the thousands of people who do voluntary work for community organisations and to find out what their particular project is all about. On the programme today, I'll be talking to Susan Stokes, who's involved with the Barnsley Hospice as a volunteer, and we'll be hearing about some of the activities of the hospice in which she's involved. Now then, Sithy, does thou want to know more about Barnsley dialect? Well, Dave Cherry's been making a study of the way we talk in Barnsley, and has some interesting things to say about it. He'll be telling us more later in the programme. But first, we hear from Dave Hodgson. He's been providing the narration and doing the interviewing for a series of five video documentaries going under the overall title of Treasures of the Dern, which Barnsley Local TV has just completed for the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Each programme features a different aspect of the huge clean-up operation which has been carried out to rectify the effects of the Industrial Revolution. When the factories and coal mines were working, over many years they churned out masses of industrial waste, and when they eventually all shut down, they had left parts of South Yorkshire and the Dern Valley as industrial wastelands. Well, a project to clean up the areas and create nature reserves for the preservation of wildlife has been carried out to provide places which everyone can visit. But I'll let Dave tell you more about it all. Something extraordinary is happening in the Dern Valley. Its blackened landscape and dead waterways have been transformed into a haven for wildlife. Barnsley Local Television has made a series of films to celebrate this remarkable achievement. Throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, the Dern Valley was exposed to relentless industrialisation. As the Industrial Revolution unfolded, its landscape and waterways were reshaped by coal mining and other industries. At that time, water was the main source of power, and at Woosbury Mill, you can still see it at work. Every hour, the mill uses 105 tonnes of water to grind corn. The two mill stones, driven by the water wheel, weigh one and a quarter tonnes. Then the invention of an efficient steam engine changed everything. Coal drove the new steam engines and the Dern Valley's rich seams of good quality coal helped power the Industrial Revolution and change the world. Canals were built to get goods to market. They involved some remarkable feats of engineering, such as this magnificent aqueduct. The aqueduct is now gone, apart from these stones by the footpath. Seventy barges a week would pass by here carrying coal, sand for nearby glassworks and many other products. Railways then revolutionised the transport of coal and other goods to all parts of the country. Oaks Viaduct dominated the landscape at Hoyle Mill. All that remains is this strange structure on the side of the valley, blocks of stone in the River Dern and these railway lines in the road. Coal mining and industry brought prosperity but left a badly damaged environment in a bad state. Waterways were dead and the landscape was scarred by spoil heaps and dereliction. Repairing the damage was a major task and the Dern Valley is a great example of organisations working together to improve the environment. Waterways have been cleaned and kingfishers are now seen along their banks. New habitats have been created and existing ones protected. In Wumwell Wood, we spoke to Professor Melvin Jones, who explained how the ancient woodland was managed. Before 1700, people didn't plant trees to make woods. 
so that the 1700 is the mark but what you try to do is to find documentary evidence of the wood in existence earlier uh, so uh, there was a survey in the 1980s by the Countryside Commission uh, and they sort of label all the woods throughout the country and you'd be glad to know that one well wood was included. In the Dern Country Park the boggy valley bottom is now an attractive lake and the former railway line a well used footpath. At Carlton Marsh a new wader scrape has been created and the reed beds refreshed to support more wildlife. Abandoned industrial sites have been transformed. The most remarkable example is at Manvers where the colliery, railway marshalling yard and coking plant form the largest single area of derelict land in the country. It's now a thriving commercial and residential area and also the home of Old Moor Nature Reserve. Old Moor was excavated out of land used for storing coal. Not only is it a wonderful nature reserve, it is also a fine piece of engineering and flood control. Its different habitats, open water, wader scrapes, reed beds and woodland teem with wildlife. The elusive bittern, once extinct, is now nesting there. The Dern Valley is at the forefront of a campaign to save another elusive bird, the willow tit, the country's most threatened resident bird. The campaign has attracted national attention. The Dern Valley is a great success story of renewal and nature conservation. The sites filmed are all great places to visit. They are places where you can relax and enjoy nature. They have been created out of decay and dereliction and they remind us that planet Earth is infinitely renewable if human beings are willing to give it a chance. For more information about the films go to Barnsley local television website. Dave Hodgson telling us about the big changes in the Derm Valley and across South Yorkshire. The five videos are on the front page of our website for you to watch and they cover each nature reserve in much greater detail. And whilst we're still on the subject of the treasures of the Dern, you know there's always something that can occasionally happen to disrupt a carefully planned filming session. When shooting a series this is what happened to Dave struggling manfully against overwhelming odds. There's a great deal to learn here and the children can come, as I said, uh, and have lessons here. But that's not all. There's actual place for them to... <laughs> hey, that's a, that's a good one for the outtakes. Dave Hodgson battling and losing the battle against a chorus of dogs during the shooting of the Wordsborough Mill video. Dave did try it again later, and this time was successful. But now on to our next item on today's programme. Susan Stokes spent a great deal of her time working as a volunteer at Barnsley Hospice, a subject that is close to many people's hearts. She was born in Barnsley in 1951 and went to Barnsley Girls High School, then went into the teaching profession, but she still wanted to do something a bit different. And of course, by now, she had a wealth of experience under her belt. So, after working in Barnsley schools, she went on to Warwick University, where she entered a national project all about economic and national understanding, and eventually, she set up her own business. But now, in retirement, she's moved back to Barnsley and taken up other interests, and one which she is passionate about as a volunteer for Barnsley Hospice. Sue came into our studio earlier and I began by asking her why she had wanted to become involved with Barnsley Hospice. Well, I came back to Barnsley having had a career away in the West Midlands and I didn't know anybody because I hadn't worked here. 
So I needed to make contact with people, to have a social life and have a purpose. And I'd had contact with Barnsley Hospice through a card, and I'll talk about that later. Um, but I needed to have, as I say, a purpose. So I went to them and said, could I help in any way? Because I had a realisation that the funding, they needed support for funding, um, and through all sorts of projects, they needed help. Um, I needed a purpose, so I wanted to volunteer. And I had a conversation with their volunteer manager in the day, and I'm going back now 10 or 12 years at least. Um, and she um, identified lots of ways in which I might be able to help. And shall we say the story starts there. Um, it's local to me, I can walk there. Um, it's, it's, it's a lovely place to work. Um, a great crowd of people and the knowledge that you're actually making a contribution to something that you hope you're never going to use um, makes it worthwhile, but it will be a benefit to other people perhaps. So Barnsley Hospice has been a great point in my life for helping me come back into Barnsley. Right, okay, interesting. Now it's pretty obvious that uh, all hospices uh, rely quite heavily on fundraising too. Uh, why is it so important? Well. Barnsley Hospice actually does get a grant from the NHS of around about 1.25, 1.5 million, should I say. However, they need a minimum of four million pounds. Is that annually? Annually. Wow. To provide all the services that they provide. So that difference of 2.5 million pounds has to be found. And so far, touch wood, mm -hmm. the people of Barnsley, the businesses of Barnsley, anybody within Barnsley and slightly beyond, but primarily Barnsley people have come up trumps. They are creative in all the ways of finding funds. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. provide, the, the hospice do certain activities which they will drive forward. So things like make a will month. They encourage people to make their own wills, which is really important. And solicitors in the Barsley area will say, I'll volunteer to write a will for somebody, but the fee that I would normally have, I will give back to the hospice. Um, they will run charity, uh, so run events. For example, currently they're looking for people to join in with the North, Great North Run. And again, they're hoping that people will sponsor the runners okay. and give money back to the hospice. So fundraising is hugely important. The grant is there, it's never guaranteed, um, but the fundraising through volunteering activities, fundraising walks, sponsored activities, Light Up a Life for example, which um, we'll talk about later. Which we'll yeah. talk about later. Mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing how creative people are. I can stand in Marks and Spencers um, at Christmas time we've done this where we help people pack their bags and we put the, the orange box there and people will donate amazingly, whether they spent £2.50 at Marks and Spencer's or £102.50. People will add to that box. Just as an aside, Sue, how long has Barnsley had a hospice? When did it actually become established? Right, it's just over 25 years now since ah, it started. Ah, as long as that? Yeah, um, it started as um, something that was created in a meeting uh, down at uh, Dod Doncaster Road Church mm -hmm. um, and it was local people that said we have a need and we want they wanted people in Barnsley to have access to a local hospice right at the time people who have these life limiting illnesses and that's what the hospice provides support for people with life limiting illnesses not just cancer um, to look at their treatment and their support at that time um, and they need they would do that in the hospital but it's not the right environment because it's a holistic approach right okay it's the person their medical needs but it's also their mental needs their social needs and the extended family needs because it's a difficult time mm -hmm. and so to provide that in all that's why they looked at creating an opportunity and they sent out through the Barsley Chronicle a message that said we're looking to set up a hospice in Barsley for Barnsley people over the age of 18, can we have your help please? And funds came in bountiful numbers. 
Lovely. Now then, uh, is it your intention to continue volunteering? Oh, That's I the... certainly am. I've uh, missed it over the years. I nearly said years. it your age, but I'll not say <laughs> Don't that. say that. <laughs> um, no, I mean, volunteers are always welcome. They can volunteer from the age of 16. Mm -hmm. um, so we have had people who will come and do work placements uh, within the hospice to give them experience of working in that field. But you've also got people who have had work experience in the hospice or in the hospital or medical situation who want to uh, offer their services back once they're retired. And every age in between, people volunteer uh, in gardening at the depot where we can go and buy and deliver items to raise funds. Um, I tend to do more fundraising in terms of stalls in public places. I go out and speak. Anything that I can do uh, mm. to help with Barnsley Hospice fundraising. So, so, so what is it that you'll get personally from being a volunteer with the hospice? Oh, again, going back to that original reason why I went there, friendships. I've got people that I've been friends important. with now, yeah, really yeah. important to mm -hmm. me. So I found that I had a purpose to give those back. Um, to keep using them and keeping me fit. Keeping you busy as well. I'm busy. Yeah. Oh my goodness, yeah, absolutely. yes. Absolutely. Busy. I yeah. know that feeling, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. So, what is the Light Up the Inner Life initiative? I've heard of this. Right. Can you explain a little bit Definitely. about that? Definitely. It's one of the major ones. and it's Unless, well, we'll have a quick look at this, by uh, the way. Oh, and then great. if you want to explain it, that would be the best, best thing. So, let's just have a quick look at the Light Up uh, a life. A life initiative and then just explain a bit about it. Thank you. Together, let us light up a life. I'm lighting this candle in memory of all the loved ones who can't be with us today. So, just to explain a little bit more about the Life Initiative right. then. It's one of the most important parts of the calendar for the hospice in terms of fundraising. It's usually around the first weekend in Christmas. And the service, well there are two services, one's at St Mary's Church, the parish church of the town centre, and the other one is at the hospice. There are Christmas trees which have lights on them. And we ask people to dedicate a light in memory of somebody that's no longer around. What a around. wonderful idea. Yeah. It's, it's glorious. And when you sit in that service and there are actually four trees, all with these small lights on them, it goes into darkness first. 
and at a point in the service the lights are put on. I normally have three, perhaps four lights that I dedicate. I can find my lights. Barnsley Hospice asks people to participate in this by paying for those lights by a donation. So you can go along to those services and see your lights because I, I know you will find the number of lights that you've had. But at the same time, this is where I come in, they offer you a card with that person's name written on that card mm -hmm. to have with you in your own home over Christmas that reminds you that there's a light shining in St Mary's Church or at the hospice in memory of that person. Yeah. And that name, to me, the way that I try to write it, values that person. But at the same time, you know that you've given towards a fantastic organisation at the hospice mm -hmm. by fundraising mm -hmm. for that light. Sue Stokes talking about the Light Up a Life project at Barnsley Hospice. And if you would like to volunteer to help at the hospice or make a donation, the details are on the screen right now. Another of Sue's interests is Barnsley U3A. In the last Focus programme, if you remember, I talked to Alan Swan, who told us all about the U3A. And in a later programme, I'll be talking to Sue about her U3A involvement. Now then, on to Barnsley dialect and Dave Cherry. Dave came into our studio to tell me more about the history of the dialect. But we start with a song which Dave has written about a fault which he has found with the Stairfoot Roundabout. As the same Barnsley Stairfoot Roundabout. There's a bus lane down the middle that's never ever used. So I'd love to go and sort that blonker out. That dreamt up that Stairfoot Roundabout. And that's Dave Cherry with his song sung in the unique Barnsley dialect. Now I'm Max Senior and we have Dave here with us. He's a well-known Barnsley character whose dialect song raised thousands of pounds, would you believe, for the Barnsley Hospice and whose latest project is to find out why the Barnsley dialect is disappearing. Long time no see you, Dave. Yeah, How's yeah. it going? I'm, I'm okay, Max. It's to others as the same badly. That's the problem. It's everybody else. <laughs> yeah. So, um, the songs in dialect. Yeah. Can you explain to everybody who is not from around here what, it's, what it all means? Just give us another four bars. <laughs> I'd like to get me hands upon the fart Who thought up the stair foot roundabout Wow! <laughs> so, it really is brilliant showing this Barnsley dialect. Now then there's words in there that such as Ilklimoor Bar Tap for example Yeah. Uh, um, uh, people down south haven't got a clue what that is. Go well uh, Max, uh, <coughs> actually in Ilkley they don't talk like that but at it means without the at yeah without yeah, the at. So yeah. it's only around here around barnsley who, who says that like the, that song uh, uh i'd like to get my hands upon the fat well that's self-explanatory mm -hmm. who thought up the stair foot roundabout thought up the stair foot roundabout it's so funny the dialect that the 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 the, the, the actual connotation of roundabout is bat so it's easy to rhyme with. <laughs> yeah. So what's this about Royston and a balloon then, Dave? Well, Royston, <coughs> the actual dialect, it, it's, it's easy. From the town centre, it, it, it's a radius of five miles. So if you, if you look at that five mile radius, which takes you to Oil and Common, Swing Round, West Melton, over to Royston, uh, that area, over to Darton, swing back round, in verbatim, word for word, it's word for word, Perfect. Now then, I've tried going back in, in history. Roy, let's do, right, Royston, let's just get to that one first. Royston, the anomaly. In, eight, in the 1890s, uh, a load of miners come from a Staffordshire village to work the Moncton collieries. I've got it, yeah, yeah. So they brought a lot of dialect words with them, like, for instance, a ball, bus, they say boss, you know. So I've tried going back in time. Um, uh, I found a remarkable book, The History of Silkston, 
in 1855 a wonderful tale on a balloon. All the people come one summer's night in 1855, they all saw this balloon and they all come running out to really? <laughs> end of the world sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it crashed near Blacker Green Dam. Oh, I know uh, Blacker Green Dam. Yeah, yeah. we were kids. And one bloke, the actual balloon crashes, and this bloke called William Garnet, Bill Garnet, that's a common name, yeah. says, that knows that bloke, he had top weight on, odded it down. That knows that he had top weight on, odded, odded it, it down. Holding yeah. it down. Holding it down. So yeah. that proves my theory that 1955, they talk like us. Actually, it were, all, it were false news because it was to celebrate the fall of Sebastopol in the Crimean War. Ah, right, in the Crimean yeah. War, 1855, and actually the city hadn't fallen, so it, false news. Yeah, so if you yeah. fast forward then to 2021, Dave, would you say that the dialects changed over the years? Oh, definite. It's, yeah, I, what I'm finding out that people uh, under 55, under 50, they don't speak like we do. The, uh, there's a lot of dialect <coughs> words gone. Russian, Lakin. Mm. Coit, boit, you know, these dialect words are slowly gone. I'm interested in the word larem. Larem, well, well, I mean, Dad used to say it. He used to say, I'll put larem on. on. Yeah. It's the alarm, backwards. Larem. I don't, why they said that, I do not know. Yeah. It's very, very interesting. Uh, yeah, so. You uh, never hear that these days, but my no. dad used to use that word as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you find out that, you know, like a last from where I was brought up in Woodsboro, my Mary a last from Dorothy, who worked at Paper Mill. So, you know, this was, uh, like before all this movement, uh, the endemic movement of travel, mm. demographic movement of travel, the people stopped in the old, in the old locality, you know. Mm. Mm. So, uh, and that's what happened, like, you know, a last married a, uh, a lad from Pitt, married a last from Paper Mill or Brooks Motors, and it stopped there. So, art, it, you, you, this is like before cars, it's only in the last, what, 1950s when, you know, uh, when our dads had that yeah. started buying cars, you and know. when travel became cheaper, people could yep. start to work away from where they were living. Yeah. Like, I mean, my son went to live, live in London, yep. work in London, yep. then moved back to Harrogate, brought yeah, up yeah. two grandkids, yeah, yeah. don't speak a word about the dialect, well, so my, it's gone. It's well, gone. My, well, my son's 10,000 miles away in New Zealand. He's a copper there in New Zealand. Does he use <laughs> it, Dave? He's, he, still lives, he still lapses back into it. And my grandson is, is 17 now, nah, Ryan. He loves this, we'll say, it's chucking it down. He, yeah, he, he yeah, just yeah. couldn't uh, understand, you yeah. know. Oh, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. But, but uh, it, it is surprising how the dialect's going. Going. Now then, just for the benefit of them that's listening to this or reading this, we want, or Dave wants, people to come forward and tell us of the disappearing dialect words. And there must be hundreds and hundreds out there. Yeah. So if you want to help out with this particular project, this research that Dave's involved with, get in touch with Dave and he will let you know, uh, well, he'll, he'll, he'll compile all these words because I do believe that Dave's gonna eventually write a book about this. So Dave, uh, thanks very much for helping us out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and thanks very much for coming in. Yeah. And I'm sure that at uh, some point in the near future, we'll get Dave Cherry back in the studio and we'll do a real live history on this guy because let me tell you, he's got a story to tell. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Okay, mate. He's behind his heart. <laughs> well, that was Dave Cherry, and I look forward to another chat with him in a later program. And that brings us to the end of Barnsley Focus for today. I hope that you've enjoyed the program and will join me for the next one when I'll be featuring more interesting people from the Barnsley area. In the meantime, as they say in Barnsley, be seeing ya, ta for now.